I'm now going to continue my video series on Henry Ward Beecher and his sermons by discussing 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. Now often this verse is quoted as a pre-trib rapture verse, but it actually has a hidden meaning. Now what is this hidden meaning? Approximately 40 years ago, a musician by the name of Bob Dylan created a song called Mr. Bojangles. And I'm going to leave a hyperlink in the description below to this very song. You're going to learn why in just a little bit. Alright, so, here's what I want you to do. This is a homework assignment for you. In just a moment, I'm going to tell you to pause this video. When you do, I want you to click that hyperlink below. I want you to listen to the song. And then afterwards, I want you to think about a link between that song and this Bible verse. Hopefully you can figure it out right off the bat. If you can't, I will go ahead and explain it to you. Alright? So, right now I want you to pause this video, click that hyperlink, and follow my instructions. I can wait. Okay. Now you've listened to the song, you've paid real close attention to the lyrics, and now you're trying to find the connection between those lyrics and this Bible verse. Here's the connection. What happened to Mr. Bojangles and his dog? Think about it. Mr. Bojangles had a dog. It passed away. And after 20 years, Mr. Bojangles is still grieving about the dog he lost 20 years earlier. This is not the attitude of a Christian. Okay? Now then, the same type of situation was happening in Thessalonica with the Thessalonicans, okay? The Thessalonicans, they were grieving over somebody that they lost. It was somebody pretty close to them. All right? But the thing was that this bereavement was becoming a barrier to their Christian ministry. And that's why St. Paul sent this letter to them. He said, don't we believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Don't we believe that someday we will also rise from the dead and be with Jesus forever and ever? Then why are you allowing the death of this loved one to become a barrier to your Christian ministry? Yes, think about them. Yes, uh, cry some tears for them. But don't let it overwhelm you. You'll see them again. That's why this was being told. Don't let something that happened in your past become a barrier to your Christian ministry. That was the message. Now it doesn't have to necessarily be the death of a loved one that causes the barrier. Let me give you a hypothetical example. Let's say that you were a kid once a long time ago and you were unable to go to your prom because you were ill, you were poor, and you were being bullied simultaneously. Okay, so now this has made you so unhappy for so long in your life that you're no longer able to function as a human being, much less conduct a Christian ministry of any kind. Well, it was elements of that past life that have crept into your present life that have become a barrier to you today. So let's correct some of this. First of all, what is the definition of a prom? It's a party. Okay? It's a very specific party. The idea of this party, it was, it was basically the last time that you were supposed to see all your friends at school before you graduated and you moved on to your lives. Okay? It also was giving you an opportunity to become romantically involved with the people in your class. This is where you dressed up in the monkey suits. You had this quiet party in the hopes that you would get romantically involved with somebody and settle down. Okay, so let's address the problems here. Here you have been ill, bullied, and impoverished. Which meant that you lacked social skills at that time. You lacked intelligence at that time. These three things, the bullyism, the poverty, and the illness, became a humongous distraction to you. 
which caused a lack of learning on your part, which caused a lack of social interaction on your part. Usually people that experience poverty, illness, and bullyism at the same time are not very social. And they're thinking so much about those things that they are incapable of thinking about the things that are really important, like their education. And this causes a perpetual nightmare for these people as they get into their adult lives. And so what is the answer? Now think about this. There are some reverends in the world that recognize the real problems and they try to fix those. There are other reverends, on the other hand, that when they're saying, they're saying, well, just forget about it, just forget about it. Those type of reverends have never experienced something like this, so they have no area of expertise when it comes to this. If they tell you just to forget about it, walk away. You come here, you walk away from them. But if they tell you to come here or they intervene in your life to fix the problems that you have today, which are a direct result of the problems you had way back then, then those particular reverends you need to hang around with because they're good people. So, how do we fix a lot of these problems? Okay. Most likely, if you had those problems back then, you still have those problems today. More than likely, you are probably still living in the neighborhood of the very bullies that pummeled you in school. That's a problem. You're probably still ill and you're probably still undereducated. So, let's start fixing the problems. The first problem you need to fix is your undereducation. How are you be how are you going to read a textbook like this? If you don't have the ability to read it, it doesn't happen. The first thing a reverend should tell you is that God cannot make you a mechanic if you, if you don't know how to fix a car. God cannot make you an accountant if you can't read financial information. And God can't make you a doctor unless you can read medical textbooks. And because you suffered such a lack of education back then, well, you're still suffering. And the thing is, you're too impoverished right now to get the education that you need to fix the problem. That's where I come along. And I say, no, wait a minute. I'm going to provide you with the education that you can't afford to get anywhere else. And that's what I do. I do this every day on YouTube. So... We've cracked the first problem. The first problem is your lack of education. Now you don't have it. You go and you watch my YouTube channel, you watch all of my videos, you get that education, and now you can read textbooks like this. And textbooks like this can make you accountants and doctors and mechanics and all the, all the other things that you want to be. Because now you're able to read something like this, you can read them, you can get that education. Now, once you get that education, you can get out of your poverty. And that starts a chain reaction. First of all, you have to keep in mind that as you continue to get this education, you develop inner strength. You don't need fists like this. You need inner strength. That's what you need. And that starts solving the bullying situation. Okay, And I'll show you how that works in just a second. But, now you have inner strength, you have education, which is now putting an end to your financial situation. Let me tell you something, reverends, okay? For those of you who don't know. Now, some reverends know this, but some of them don't. But the ones who don't know, listen to this. If your congregation is undereducated, they're probably also getting underpaid. Now, you're wanting to get tithes out of these people, okay? Which is a good thing. You should. If they're undereducated and they're underpaid, how in the world are they going to give tithes to you? It doesn't work that way. When you invest in their education, most likely they will feel enough gratitude towards what you've done for them that they will then give tithes. That's the way it works. 
So if you want more tithes in your church, invest in their education. And many of them will actually return and give you the tithes that you, that they, that you need. So, so it's a win-win for everybody. Okay. So now we've fixed the tithing situation. We've also fixed an inner strength situation, which is putting, putting it into bullyism. We've also solved the financial situation. And what about that social situation? We're solving that too. How are we doing that? Okay. When you are well educated, you can start reading things like this. The Reader's Digest. Now the modern Reader's Digest, the ones that have come out in the 21st century, they don't have a lot of stories. But if you'll go back to your library, and a lot of libraries have this, not everybody, but a lot of libraries do, if you'll go back to your bigger libraries and look through some of the older editions of Reader's Digest, some like in the 70s, the 80s, and the early 90s, you can read a lot of good stories. You can use the memory techniques from Harry Lorraine to memorize those stories, so therefore you have a better chance of social interaction. So now I've improved your social skills, your financial situation has improved, your inner strength has improved, because now you have all this education down your throat. So that means your bullying situation is also going to improve. And Parts of your life are going to now get fixed. Now then, another thing that improves is your illness situation. How does that work? The more financial resources you have, the better doctors you will find. And those doctors will help you manage your illnesses. So now your illness situation gets improved. God may not remove the illnesses from your life. But he may be able to now send you to doctors who can help you manage your illnesses. Another barrier removed. Okay, so illness is no longer your barrier to performing Christian doctrine. And your financial situation has improved, so now you can go places and you can be a part of things that you weren't able to be a part of anymore. Your social interaction has improved. Your inner strength has improved, and if you're still living in the same neighborhood as the people who used to bully you, put your house up for sale and get out and move away. They're bullying me on social media. Okay, shut down your social media. It's not as fun to try to bully somebody if they're not there to be bullied. Shut it down. Don't need it anyway. You got God, you got other people, you don't need this. And remember this. If your friends believe the words of the bullies over you, they weren't much of your friends anyway. So ditch them. Another problem fixed. Now I'll also tell you another thing that improves when you got this new education. This new education allows you to get into exclusive clubs. that bullies often can't follow you to. So now you're in one place, they're in another place. Eventually, they're going to find it to be such an effort to try to bully you anymore that they'll find an easier target to pick on. Now, I will grant you some bullies do tend to grow up and they do tend to realize what they've done and they stop bullying people and they, and they start living a good life. But some bullies will spend their entire lives bullying people. And they'll die miserable. Remember that. If they continue to bully all the days of their life, they die miserable. And once they die, once those particular bullies die, then guess what happens? People start spitting on their graves. Think about that. So, we've solved your financial problem, we've solved your illness problem. We've solved your bullying problem. One shot. You say, well, I missed that opportunity to be at prom years ago. So what? Let me tell you something. If God wanted you to get romantically involved with any of those people, it would have already happened. 
Maybe your soulmate was not there. And if your soulmate wasn't there, why did you bother to go? See what I mean? So now, you're in a better financial situation, your illnesses are under control, and your bullying situation has ceased. So there's nothing stopping you from finding your soulmate. Nothing now is going to stop you from doing that. So what do you do? You take your better financial resources, you tithe what you need to tithe back to God through the church, and you take the rest of it after you pay your bills, and you go out and you host your own prom party. Call it a prom all you like. Invite all your new friends, because you're going to make new friends automatically. Because you're going to be in new social circles thanks to your higher education. Invite them. And eventually, you might luck out, and God may lead you directly to your real soulmate. And you'll be a lot happier. And then you and your soulmate could do the work that God wanted the both of you to do in the first place. Problem solved. then all this regret stuff won't be in your way anymore and you get, get on to doing your real Christian ministry congratulations you're back to where you need to be okay now then I want to give a special footnote to those people who are facing bullyism in school today because you need to know this as well. I want you to go to Acts chapter 16. Okay, we're all going to go to Acts chapter 16. Alright, we're in Acts chapter 16, and I want you to go all the way past verse 30. And I'm going to tell you how to solve your bullying situation once and for all. We're going to put it into this once and for all. How are we going to do this? Okay, we've got Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and following. What was going on here? Paul had been wronged by the magistrates. Paul was a Roman citizen, and the magistrates didn't treat him like a Roman citizen. And Paul refused to leave that jail until... The Roman magistrates publicly told everybody what they had done wrong and publicly fixed what they did wrong. Now, how is this a solution to bullyism? Okay, you got the better education, you got the inner strength now. So, what do you do with that? I want you to enter every spelling bee, geography bee, and everything else you could possibly enter yourself into. I don't want the spotlight to shine brightly on you. Yes, you're the victim. I want the spotlight to shine on you. Why is that? Because bullies do not like spotlights. That's one thing they don't like. They like to work in the shadows. If you're in the spotlight all the time, it's going to make it a lot harder for them to bully you. Maybe not impossible, but it's going to be a lot of work. After a while, they don't want to work on that. Secondly, remember this. If you're doing that well in school, you get placed in exclusive clubs. You get placed in AP, well, AP Calculus, AP this, AP that. You get placed in all these AP courses. The bullies then have to work harder to be in your classroom. And when that happens, a lot of times they'll say, it's not worth the effort, they find somebody else to bully. You say, well, my friends are still getting bullied the same way I was. Okay, well, you tell your friends to do the exact same thing I just told you to do. If they do, their bullying will stop too. If they don't, that's not your problem. See what I mean? All problems solved in one swift shot. And then all of you can go on to do your Christian ministries. And you'll all be a lot happier for it. Whew. That's a lot to say. A good reverend will tell you this kind of information. That's the way it works. 
if a good reverend does tell you this kind of information, by golly, stick with him. He's a good leader. You need to stick with him. And he'll teach you other things that will help you not only develop a romantic life, but a good, wholesome, healthy life. This is the kind of person that will work on all areas of your life. But if a reverend comes to you and just says, oh, just forget about the past, and doesn't help you fix your current problems, don't follow him. He does not have your interest in, at heart. He doesn't care about what happens to you. He might say it, but he doesn't really mean it. That's the difference. It's all in the matter of what advice you're getting from a reverend. If you're getting the advice I said in this video, that's a good reverend. If not, if he's just trying to brush you off, walk away. That's the difference. Alright, I will tell you more in a future video. Stay tuned.